In the sermon this morning, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter uh, Luke chapter 18, um, in which uh, we get the reading of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And with those two men, we see two very different approaches to praying, two very different approaches uh, to God and to life in general. And we want to consider those two approaches. Um, one is of pride and one is of humility. And we're going to consider those this morning in the sermon. So be on the lookout for that, uh, not just in Luke 18, but in all the readings, because uh, it's actually there in all of them. So God's blessings on your worship this morning, and uh, welcome again to beautiful city.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near to God with a true heart and confess our sins unto God the Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, and for your sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is in his holy habitation. He settles the solitary in a home. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. O God, when you went out before your people in your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy.
give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things that we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Our Old Testament reading for the 11th Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Reading from Psalm chapter 50. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not accept the bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and all the of the hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all the moves in the field is mine. If I will not tell you, the world is Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? I'll tell you the sacrifice of the and the Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. For you hate discipline, and you pass my words behind you. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it will be forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand by which you are being saved. 
if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all of the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of his apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. This is the word of the Lord. that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector was standing far off not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, the light of light, very God of the very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And he was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
pain if you do not do well. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, and you must rule over it. But Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. Notice how God tells Cain to stand in one position. He tells him to stand over sin, to stand over sin and thus stand humbly before God who stands against sin, to give him a good sacrifice, a right sacrifice. Notice Abel's sacrifice was right and was good. Abel's sacrifice was of the first fruits. It was of the fat portions. It was the best sacrifice he could give. Cain's obviously was not. God told Cain to stand up, stand over sin, rule over sin. But instead, Cain chose to stand in a different place. He chose to stand over his brother. He chose to give into his own sinful desires, into his own sinful flesh, and stand over his brother, not stand over sin, but stand over his brother and slay him and kill him. He could have been humble, but he wasn't. He stood up, he stood up by himself, he wanted to stand apart from God, stand apart from the God who stood for him, and stand by himself, and that is what we call pride. And pride, standing by yourself, thinking you can do it all on your own, is really the root of all sin. All pride is sin. All sin is pride. That is the ultimate root of sin that we want to be in and of ourselves, our own human, our own individual, be prideful unto ourselves and live to stand without God, to stand by ourselves. Standing by yourself giving in to your sinful desires, leaning on your own understanding, not leaning on the understanding of God, thinking that we can do it all on our own, that is called pride. To stand by ourselves. And when we stand by ourselves, it is always easy to find someone, like Cain found Abel, to stand over. It is always easy to find someone who you can stand over and say, look how much better I am than that guy. And so Cain is really not so different than the Pharisee in the Gospel reading today, who also goes off to the temple to pray, and he stands by himself. He stands by himself so that he can be seen. He stands by himself so that he can be heard. He stands by himself so that he can talk, and his words can be heard and seen by everyone. That he can say by himself, I did this, I did that. Thank God I'm not like that guy, so that he can stand over the tax collector and slay the tax collector with his words. Thank God I'm not like this dirty, rotten tax collector standing by himself. God, I thank you. I'm not like that guy. Look at all the things I do. Look at how I can stand by myself. And that is the way that pride speaks. It speaks in eyes. It speaks in standing over others. It's considering how good of a person you suppose yourself to be. It's depending on your measly offerings, your measly tithes, your measly good works to think that you are in and of yourself amazing before God. That you are in and of yourself God pleasing. That you in and of yourself can stand and not fall. And since that is the ultimate root of all sin, since pride is sin and sin is pride, and we are all infected by sin, it is really no different for us. And if you want to know then how you struggle with sin in your life, you can ask a very simple question of yourself. And I will ask it of you now. Where do you stand? What do you stand upon? Where do you stand where you think you stand in and of yourself? You can think of ways in which you sin, and there are other ways to think of it other than just this question. You can consider your life according to the Ten Commandments, and that's a very good practice. You can talk to those who you sinned against, and they can tell you very easily where you've sinned. Just talk to your family members or your friends. They can tell you how much of a sinner you are, I'm sure. But this way, ask yourself this question is very helpful. What do I stand upon? Where 
do I stand? And for most of us, we will find that we stand on the same shifting sand that the Pharisee stands upon. You can break it down into three ways, three things that the Pharisee says that you can see kind of as categories of where people like to stand. One, the first thing he says is, why not an outright lawbreaker? Most of us recently probably can say that you have not shot someone or murdered someone, that you have not robbed someone's house, or that you have not stolen money from a good, hardworking citizen, hard-earned money, that you have not stolen money from someone or robbed their house or murdered someone or anything like that, that you're not an outright law-breaker. That's what he says. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Most of us probably have not slept with another man's wife any time recently. Not outright lawbreakers. Two, I'm generally a good person. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I have. And I can find someone that's worse than me. Thank God I'm not like that guy. Thank God I'm not like that guy. Thank God my life is not as messed up as that guy who's been through three divorces and has declared bankruptcy twice. Thank God I'm not like that guy whose son is in and out of trouble all the time. Thank God I'm not like that guy who has a hard time supporting his family and I have a good career, a good job that I can support my family with and I can take care of things with. Thank God I'm not like that guy. Thank God my lawn looks better than that guy's does. And you can all say that about me right now, but luckily Pastor Elkins is not just a wise pastor to learn former pastor things from, he's also letting me borrow his fertilizer spreader, so you won't be able to say that for long. Thank God I'm not like that guy, we can all say that. We can start to play that comparison game and we can find all sorts of little things like wands and big things like careers. We can find all sorts of things in which we're always better than someone at something. It's a comparison game and it's never ending. That's the second thing that the Pharisee does is he plays a comparison game. And finally, third, he thinks he can lean on a couple good works. I fast twice a week. I get tithes of all that I get. I fast twice a week. I give a full 10% tithe. I come to church and to Bible study and to Wednesday night Bible study. I have paid for this thing for the church out of my own pocket. I have multiple devotional practices. I say my prayers every night. I'm really not that bad of a guy. There's always someone worse than me anyway. And I'm not really an outright law breaker. Three things. Three things we can all do. Three things that are easy to do. Three things that we can always find to do in our own lives. First of all, let me say this. That those things which I mentioned. Having an externally moral life. Not being an outright lawbreaker. Having a nice lawn. Coming to church. Coming to Bible study. Doing good works. Those things are not outrightly bad or evil. And in fact, those things are blessings from God. And in fact, I desire those things for you more than you know. I actually do want you to come to Bible study. But the problem with those things is that, that, is that when we stand on them and depend on them for our own righteousness, the problem with those things is that when we think we have those things in and of ourselves and that they are not blessings from God, the problem with those things is when it, that is what we stand on, we depend on, and we use it to say, I am better than this, I don't need God, I am better than these people, I don't need them. All I need is myself and my amazing, God-pleasing works. The problem with those things is when they become all about I. That is what the Pharisee does. He says, I thank you, I am not like these other men. I pass twice a week, I give all that I have. I, 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 I. I can stand on my own without God. And that, dear friends, is pride. And that, dear friends, is sin. And all it reveals on the last day is that outwardly, while things might be fine, outwardly, while you might tithe, outwardly, while you might have a better life than that guy in some way or another way, outwardly, it's all fine. But inwardly, you are no better off. Inwardly, you're just the same as the outright lawbreaker or... 
anything else of evil and pride that the devil would have you be. Inwardly, things are just not right. And so ask yourself this question, what do I stand on? What do I stand on? What do I look to, to depend on? Where do I think I can stand by myself? And when you find what you think you can stand on by yourself, that is what you are fearing, that is what you are trusting, that is what you are loving more than God, and that is where your pride is, that is where your sin is. Where do you stand? The tax collector stood on nothing. He had an ethically questionable job in which he lived an outwardly unrighteous life. He was not outwardly righteous. He was an outright lawbreaker. He did, for a living, steal money from good, hard-working citizens. And for that, he did actually have an advantage. Again, living an outwardly moral life is a good thing. I'm not saying you should live an outwardly unrighteous life, but living an outwardly unrighteous life does have this one advantage. Being an outright lawbreaker, being lowest on the totem pole of social status, it does have one advantage, and that is that the tax collector knew he was a sinner. The tax collector could say, look, this is where I've sinned. I know I've sinned. I know I have nothing to stand on. And so, all he says is he does not say, I, 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 I. He says, God, be merciful to me. God, first, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all I have to stand on is God's mercy. That's all I have to stand on is not shifting sand, not things that can go away, not things that I have to depend on for myself, but all I have to stand on is God. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The one who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so that man went down to his house justified. That humble man, that man who knew he was a sinner, went down to his house exalted, justified, right with God. And so, dear friends, learn from this sinner. Learn from this sinner so that you can humble yourselves. Humble yourselves under the mighty hands of God so at the proper time he may exalt you. Come to this house. Come to this house of worship justified. Come to this house of worship to stand and to pray. Not as a self-righteous person to say, look, I've come to church this week. Look, I can check that off my box. Look at me. Look how I can stand by myself. Look how I can pray. I, 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 I. No, but come to this house and pray standing on Christ your rock. Standing, not by yourself, but on God's mercy saying, I confess to you, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment, and receive God's forgiveness. Come to this house, come to this temple, and pray, and confess, and stand, not by yourself, but with your fellow sinners, and confess, and receive exaltation. For when you come and when you humble yourself, Christ will exalt you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first his forgiveness. This is of first importance, and these things will be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Confess your sins. Receive his forgiveness. Receive his absolution for you in Christ, and these things will be added unto you. The earthly blessings God gives will be added unto you. The tithes, the offerings, the good works, the nice lawns, everything that God would have you have if you desire, if he desires you to have it, will be added unto you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. So I ask you again, where do you stand? Where do you stand? Well, I remind you, brothers and sisters, that it is this gospel in which you stand. That is what Paul reminds the Corinthians of. It is this gospel in which you stand, in which I have passed down to you that you have received. This is the place you now stand. That Jesus was died. That Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures and that he was raised again in accordance with the scriptures. 
that it is by Christ, by His humiliation, and by His exaltation that you stand. You stand in Christ, for Christ humbled Himself first. He humbled Himself first to the point of death, even death on the cross, where He shed His blood. Blood that cries from this altar a better word than the blood of Abel which cries from the ground. He shed His blood, humbling Himself to the point of death on a cross, so that He might die with your sin, die with your humiliation, die with all of your unrighteousness on which you cannot stand, and He buried it. And He was exalted again on the third day, rose again on the third day, exalted to new life. New life which He gives to you, new life which He exalts you with, new life which you can have in and of yourself with Him, eternally. That is where we stand. We stand on Christ, we stand on His blood. And so when you are prideful, or when you have lost all pride and you despair, when you look to others to stand over them, or when others look down on you, no matter what it is that you look to stand on, confess it. Put it away with Christ, bury it with Christ. Let his blood wash you. The blood that cries a better word than the word of Abel. Let his blood wash you of that pride, of that despair, and stand on Christ. Stand confident on His blood. Stand confident on His mercy for you. And I pray that that is where you stand now. And I pray that that is where we all stand, together, in this house, together, justified under Him, until the last day when He comes again, until the last day when we get to stand with Him eternally, robed in white, washed in His blood, standing with Him forever, singing His praises next to His throne, to Christ eternally, to Him be all the honor and glory and power forever. Let us stand on Him. Amen. We continue with the offertory. <laughs> Christ, your Son, our Lord, forgive our sins. Fill us with your Spirit that we would remain humble, never forgetting that we have been saved by grace through faith, which was not our doing, but your gracious gift. Lord, in your mercy, be merciful to our neighbors, especially those who have sinned against us and done us harm. Give us patience and strength that we would deal with them gently and humbly, and that we would be ready to forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, in your mercy, be merciful to your church both here and in every place. Send forth faithful servants to deliver your grace and mercy to sinners in need. Defend all pastors from arrogance and pride, and strengthen them in the faithful preaching of your word, and th that true unity and faith would ever be found wherever Christ is cru wherever Christ crucified is proclaimed. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to our leaders that they would exercise the authority given them with wisdom and righteousness so that we would be enabled to live in peace and quietness. Be merciful also to those who serve in our military, especially Andrew, Quentin, Andrew, Terry, Katie, Nicholas, Austin, and Mark. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to all those in need, especially the families of this congregation, 
that they might live in ordered harmony according to your word. Look in mercy also upon all orphans who are in need of parents to care for them, provide them with loving fathers and mothers. Comfort and strengthen all widows in their time of need, and provide them with all that they need, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Be merciful to the sick and sorrowing, especially Allison, Shannon, Evelyn, Ed, Georgia, Tyler, Marlene, Christine, Samuel, Marcy, Mary, Richard, Terry, John, Sonny, Terry, Tony, Morgan, Chris, Mark, Linda, Kareem, Katie, Reese, Frank, Carolyn, Betty, Mary, Mike, Melissa, Donna, Patricia, Nancy, Jana, Joanne, Eileen, and Gary. That they would receive not only temporal relief, but that in all times and places, under all circumstances, they would know the forgiveness of their sins and hope of the eternal life won for them in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to those who come to the holy altar today, that they would approach your throne of grace humbly and with reverence, that they would receive the true body and blood of Christ in faith and for the highest good, being united in one holy fellowship with all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in faith toward Him until life everlasting. Depart now. His peace.
and we implore you, Lord, of mercy, to strengthen us through the same and faithful joy and love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Lord, put up his covenants upon you and give you peace.